Now you can hear me. Can you? That's great. Perfect, thank you very much for attending this session. Uh, my name is Tomas Clemente, I'm senior consultant uh, in uh, uh, ProServe, professional services, in the global financial service practice. And the purpose of today is actually to share with you a, a few of the insights that we have gathered with our customers about uh, securing a container and serverless services. Um, the, uh, the idea of today is that actually we talk about uh, how serverless and container services are built. Um, how we can build uh, the kind of a model that we can use to actually build security about uh, our serverless and container services, how we can embed all of these strategies into a pattern of uh, secure deployment, and then we'll finish with a little bit of a demo, small demo, um, about how to, we can actually make these things work, uh, this principle work. Now, this is a very wide subject, so we are not, obviously we are not going to enter into detail in one hour session in all the complexities that both serverless and, secure and container services um, uh, entail. So what I would like you to actually um, go is, is to uh, attend uh, more of the sessions that explain more in detail some of the uh, complexities, in particular when it comes to the runtime security of, uh, of container automation, that we are going to see very little in here. Now, um, serverless and containers. Um, well, basically, um, serverless is already, I mean, this is an approach that it's uh, already come to stay um, since uh, Bernard Vogels has announced that no server is in, easier to manage than uh, no server. Well, what we have, uh, I mean, our customers have embraced that, uh, that easiness of use. Um, it's not the only advantage of, uh, of adopting serverless technology, but in particular when we say serverless, what we, what we aim for is for the heavy lifting, I mean, we aim for the removal of the heavy lifting of uh, everything that is related to server operations, management, um, patching, uh, providing infrastructure, maintaining that infrastructure. We aim to take away all of that, but that's not the only, the only uh, tenant. It's we provide also automatic scaling. Uh, we provide as well a model where actually you pay for the value that you are consuming when the, we use the several ser the, uh, our several services. And we build these services in a way that is highly available and secure. So in all in all, um, this translates into a lot of advantages for a customer, and that's mainly the basic reason for the uh, uh, coming success. Um, Serverless in AWS, um, it's an operational model that actually spans along a lot of services. Uh, basically, in the compute, we have Lambda and uh, Fargate, which is our serverless container management services. We have data stores, whether they are objects or file stores like S3 or database, serverless databases like Aurora Serverless or DynamoDB. Uh, and we aim also uh, to provide a number of services that, uh, that help you uh, to manage all the integration of these different elements into building um, compact and uh, coherent services. So like AP Gateway, SQS, um, Amazon SNS, uh, um, AppSync, uh, there is a whole ecosystem of tools that we provide you to make the uh, building of services using serverless technologies easier. Now, um, as I said at the beginning, um, serverless is a service that is aiming to make things easier. That translates into the kind of simple architectures that we can also build using serverless services. This is a very simple pattern. Um, API Gateway to actually provide a la exposure layer for um, receive and handle requests from uh, another external client, external clients. Uh, Lambda Functions, which is our compute service that we are going to build code in it to manage and deal with uh, those uh, requests, applying a business logic that we are going to uh, we are going to define into the code, and DynamoDB to actually store permanently the, the data and the states that our current business logic requires to make it work. From a security perspective point of view, this is a very simple pattern, um, and that entails that it's also a way. Um, very straightforward to define security controls. We have to build um, 
authentication and uh, authorization into our API gateway. We have to build uh, proper um, input validation and, ma and uh, IAM permissions into our Lambda model, and we have to ensure that the data that we need to make the whole thing work is actually available there, so we have to build um, backup uh, restores and uh, deal with the different states that, that we require for our application to work in case of mistakes. So, because it's a simple pattern, when it comes to a escalation, and we, we aim to build very complex services, it's also a very repeatable pattern, and that facilitates our task in terms of security professionals because we have to apply just the same controls a little bit everywhere. Um, the the uh, type of controls, they n do not change. Uh, we have to apply the same type of controls everywhere. The form of the controls, the content of the controls itself, they might change depending on what you are using for the, uh, the Lambda function or the service in particular, but in general, it becomes a repeatable pattern. Now, um, when it comes to uh, the coexistence of the uh, serverless world with a non-serverless world, then it becomes a little bit more complicated because uh, uh, the non-serverless world exists still with infrastructure, and the infrastructure has been built in a traditional, in a lot of cases, in a traditional model of perimetral security. So right now, what happens? It, it happens that some of these infrastructure is still needed to manage our business logic, whether they are for the data that we need to consult, because it's still using infrastructure, whether it's in AWS or you know, on-premises, we still need that data that is there or uh, because there are other components of our business logic that cannot be migrated all at once into a serverless world. So there is a, a kind of migration model where we still need some infra. And then it becomes a little bit more complicated because right now, uh, what happens is that our repeatable pattern of security controls, there's not that repeatable anymore. Now we have to double. We have both the serverless world and the non-serverless world, and we have to make them coexist. And when it comes to um, the, uh, the business logic, which is actually the core of all of it, and the, the most important element outside, beside the data, of course, uh, then what we realize is that when we have to make coexist uh, both serverless and non-serverless world, the modeling of the, core, of the core business logic, they can actually be everywhere. They, they can be anywhere. They can be serverless lambda functions or they can be ECS. The, as I said before, the, what we are dealing here is um, we need to secure that core business logic somehow. We'll see how, <laughs> at least in some cases. But uh, everything that is around our core business logic still needs to be protected, and that doesn't change whether, or changes very slightly, independently of if we use code or containers. So in that sense, um, we actually, uh, I think we think that that is absolutely normal. Uh, they are both based, I mean, they are both technologies that have been developed so to support microservices uh, architectural patterns. The core business logic, as I said, can be modeled as code as containers. Our database, whether we use Lambda functions or um, Fargate containers, they are going to, we have to protect them all the same. So uh, we definitely can come with an accurate thought model where we can secure both serverless-based architectures and container-based architecture and all the elements that are all around it with, with the same model. And, uh, well, that's what we are going to discuss uh, here for a while. But what is that model? What do we have to include into that model so we can define what are the security controls that we need to put into every layer of the architecture? Let's start with the compute. Um, the compute uh, layer actually is the one that it handles your uh, your core business logic. The comp basically, uh, your uh, whatever you, services you decide to use or combination of services you decide to use into your compute layer, what we will have is that they will handle the requests for internal or external systems. They will have to process that, that those requests and they have to ensure that those requests are handled, prof uh, handled properly. So it contains as well, uh, the runtime environment that we decide to run and to program our core business logic, whether we use uh, Java or Go or Ruby or Node.js or whatever it is, well, everything is part of this layer. And in, in that sense, well, when it comes to pure serverless of some infrastructure that is required, obviously we have a Lambda function in one side of the spectrum, which is pure serverless, only code. We'll take care of everything else. 
and uh, we have a ACS and the Kubernetes over ACS, which where actually some infrastructure still is required to be managed to actually run your containers. Um, then we have the data layer. The data layer, as I said, is when you are going to put your persistent data that your the core business logic that you uh, decided to program into the compute layer, well, here is where the persistent data or the state application data is going to be handled. Again, we have more infrastructure <laughs> or less infrastructure. When it comes to more infrastructure, we can use traditional things like it can be Elastic Cache or uh, databases or uh, Amazon RDS. Or we can go to a model where actually our data is in S3 and they just become file objects uh, in buckets. Uh, we need to have also a communication layer. A communication layer is going to be precisely the, the glue that is going to make uh, everything all together work. Uh, we need to provide messaging and uh, state uh, consistency sometimes between different um, elements of the core application in the, in, the, um, in the compute layer or synchronization of data. Well, this is where we are going to introduce the elements that are going to um, communicate, help elements communicate to each other. Um, we can use uh, definitely things like SNS, uh, our uh, notification system, or Kinesis in case that you need streaming real data, or in the case that actually you have a still legacy infrastructure or, or, or uh, um, infrastructure-based services in AWS, we will need to build a VPC. And that VPC, well, well you probably you all, know, you all know what it is. Uh, so it's basically uh, the replication of a network. So we are talking here about a networking mechanism to provide network traffic. Uh, we have an edge. Uh, the edge is precisely the system where, where we are going to expose our, uh, our services uh, to the external world, and it's going to be handled for there. Um, in that sense, the main services that we are going to put into this layer, well, at least what we propose, is CloudFront. Some of you might argue, all right, but for, we use API Gateway for that. Um, in, in our model, API Gateway, uh, we prefer to put it into the compute layer because we are going to probably to uh, put some of the core business logic program into the API, the way that the requests are handled and they are treated. So it makes more sense that actually we put it into the compute layer because it's not a pure edge mechanism. It's, it's going to do something with the data and with the requests. Um, we are going to have also an access and management identity, which actually is going to decide uh, to attribute the permissions to both your internal and external um, uh, uh, customers and utilizations uh, and users of the application, but also of the management of the whole system. And uh, we are going to have a layer on system monitoring and deployment. Uh, for the system monitoring part, definitely um, this is going to be the part where we uh, put the mechanism so we obtain visibility about how our application is performing, how our systems are performing, what is happening, so we can take appropriate, appropriate actions when we see things that we don't like. And the, the deployment model, it's going to be uh, the, the um, the mechanism that we are going to use to actually maintain the agility that we require to react and to deploy and to change everything that we require at the same at the at the right uh, at the right moment. Now, um, around this uh, thought model, uh, of course, we are going to have to use uh, and deploy security controls. Uh, what we always uh, let's say we are preconizing AWS is uh, the security perspective of the cloud adoption framework. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, there is a, a public white paper uh, that actually uh, talks a lot about the security perspective and how we can organize the provisioning of security controls in AWS, at least for the selection of mechanisms. But basically, uh, we, uh, we define that there, are, there, have to be four, uh, there has to be four types of controls around any services, directive, preventive, detective, and responsive. Directive and preventive, so there are mechanisms that we are going to use in order to ensure that the initial state of the provision of our resources is the desired. So we are going, uh, we are going to, uh, to decide, for example, uh, that uh, I am a certain application has to has right to a certain number of, uh, of API calls because that's the only thing that they need. So that for us is a preventive mechanism. We are not going to give 
wide access. We are going to give just the access that the application is required. Um, we are going to encrypt things by default or not using KMS. We are going to handle secrets and credentials that our core business logic might need using Secret Manager. Uh, but then we will need, we will have another type of controls which are the detective and responsive. These are post-provisioning. Once that the uh, service has been built, then we need to look at what is going on with the services and react whenever it's needed. In those cases, the detective mechanisms, they are basically uh, what we provide through guard duty, trust advisor, cloud watch, cloud trail, uh, all of these logging and monitoring mechanisms that are by default embedded into the other services. And the responses mechanisms, they are going to be uh, precisely what we are going to do if a, a certain uh, resource provision in AWS deviates of what we expect. If something that is not encrypted, to act to, I mean, that should, it should be encrypted, uh, we detect that it's not encrypted, then we are going to put the, the necessary actions in there. Um, what we are going to discuss uh, here is precisely the first part, the, the, the preventive controls, mostly directive and preventive, because uh, what, we, uh, what we see in a lot of the provisioning of the serverless services is that uh, it's a move that, it's a, mall, it's a world that moves very fast. And um, we, cannot, we cannot kind of afford uh, huge windows of vulnerabilities for uh, unprovisioned or badly provisioned resources um, if in the case that we are not doing the right thing. So we focus mostly on the preventive, so we avoid to use the other, the, the other uh, controls, the detective and responsive controls. Detective and responsive control, they still have to be there, but basically they are going to check the same thing. We are going to say, right, uh, we, I want you, for, for example, let's talk about encryption. Um, we need to have all of data encrypted. So we are going to put a lot of preventive mechanisms to ensure that all the data is encrypted. But still, we need to keep that detective control that is going to look for unencrypted data, just in case, because we cannot afford to have something that goes wrong. At the end, what happens is that both, most controls, they look exactly the same. They are just positioned at different states of the lifetime of a certain resource, but the content is the same. So now, um, let's talk about a little bit about the compute layer and the services in the compute layer. Um, first, we have, uh, of course, uh, serverless function in the form of lambdas. Uh, lambdas, uh, yeah, you, you probably already are familiar with it. Um, Developers write code in functions. Um, the, everything which is related to management of the infrastructure required for the um, for the running of your code, everything that is required to the management of the runtime that you decide to run for your code, everything that is required is for uh, scaling, patching, everything of that is handled by AWS. The only thing that, I, that I, uh, a developer needs to run a Lambda function is to write the code and choose the runtime. Everything else, including the scaling of, uh, of, uh, of the capacity needed to run the code, it's handled by us. Now, the Lambda is also built with a high availability. Uh, that means that we take care of that your function is run uh, in multiple availability zones. It's ready to be run in multiple availability zones. So you don't have to take care, let's say, of architecting your application for high availability if uh, at least for uh, one single region. That's something that we already take care of. Um, on the other side, uh, well, you might, you might also, um, let's say, want to have a little bit more of control or uh, how your, your networking is going to work, how your services are going to communicate to each other. And that's something that you want to build into your uh, application code. For those cases, when you require a little bit more of control or specific ways of working that is beside the, just the running of code, well, people typically use containers uh, because, well, they, we are going to have a container uh, business logic, uh, let's say, yeah, a no, code business logic, a container built around it with the way that we decide uh, that we decide to run, and an orchestration, an, sorry, an orchestration platform that is going to build all the interaction in between the, among the different elements that we require. Uh, in those cases, well, we have three options. We have Fargate, ECS, and AKS, which is Kubernetes with ECS. Um, Fargate is serverless engine, so again, um, you don't have to worry about the provision of infrastructure. We just take, we just take care of that, and uh, basically, um, 
yeah, we it's it's going to be let's say the most approach the set the approach most likely like a lambda function but with a core business logic that might be more complex and the more tax definitions ECS and EKS they are basically the same services they uh, is you just provide a, um, a EC2 instances where we run uh, the uh, images that are optimized for code uh, for code uh, for container executions and uh, the difference with kubernetes is that actually we provide a management uh, uh, layer and uh, management uh, the control plane that is managed by AWS so you can always provision the work and the worker nodes that you require in when you want to use uh, Kubernetes uh, nodes but still that goes through the provisioners of infrastructure running those containers the same way that ECS does now when it comes to operational re uh, responsibility well um, Obviously, Lambda is the one that requires uh, less responsibility from you. Uh, you only have to manage your code and the choice of runtime, as, you say, as I said before. We take care of everything else. Uh, in the, on the lower scale, of course, the, at the bottom of the scale, there is a traditional EC2 instance. Well, ECS and AKS, they are just above the layer of that. The, the, we, uh, let's say we take care of the orchestration uh, control plane of the um, of ACS and AKS in those cases uh, but still you have to take care of everything that is related to the management of the instance that means uh, patching uh, and maintaining the uh, operating system that is running your uh, container platforms it means deciding and sizing the right work clusters that you require for your workloads and of course it will it, it it requires to manage the application code. It's actually the same thing as in a Lambda function. Fargate, well, uh, as I said, it's serverless container management services. Everything which is related to the infrastructure management, you have to take care of it and we'll take care of that. Now, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about the issues that we observe in the, the compute layer. There are basically three common points that we observe with our customers. Um, as I said before, the purpose of the, pur of the uh, compute layer is to receive requests, handle those requests, and provide uh, right answers. And yes, with, with, uh, with let's say, a, with a building on the runtime of your choice and the shape of the runtime that you decide. Um, when it, so we have basically three areas of working here. One is the input validation, what are we going to receive? Second is how we are going to treat those requests. And we observe uh, that yeah, the vulner dependency vulnerabilities in the code is one of the major key points that we have to take care of. And the third is storing secrets. We, it's, it's worrying sometimes, but we see a lot of cases where uh, because of easiness of use or bad coding practices, we find that there is a lot of uh, whether they are AWS credentials or other application credentials that are hard-coded into the application code. Now, for uh, these three issues, we have a number of services that might be of use. Uh, for when it comes to input validation, of course, we have uh, IBWS WAF that is going to block uh, most of the common attacks, uh, uh, web attacks uh, and application attacks that are running all around their <laughs> impermanence, like ECS rules and SQL injection. This is something that we have to protect uh, every <laughs> exposed web services about. So better to use it for absolutely everything. Uh, but we have also a, uh, a possibility to actually include, as I said, um, request validation logic into the API gateway. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we included the API gateway into the compute layer. It's because we are not going to use it only to expose the business logic to be requested. It's we are only always going to put some logic in, in the inputs to decide if, it is, if the input that we are receiving in the web request is the right input. Um, we can put it into the same format and JSON format. And so basically we, we look, uh, we pre-process the request before it arrives to our container or Lambda function or a computing layer. Um, but then when it comes to the dealing with the specific parameters of an application, IP Gateway, what is going to do is just to check for the right, the, let's say that the, the input that is arriving is the right type of input, but not the right type of content within the input. That's some logic that has to be built within the 
application code. Whether they are Lambda functions or we are using Fargate containers, it's something that has to be dealt within the application. And well, it's a, it's a, let's say, fairly common development practice, so it should be already included in there. Still, we can take out some of this logic that we have to put into the code, out of the code, and into API, API Gateway. Now, when it comes to the dependency vulnerabilities, um, this is basically code analysis and code review. We need to run our code through a number of scanners and, and vulnerability tools to decide if, we, if this is something that we want to run. There are some known vulnerabilities on the libraries and dependencies that we are using. Um, there are a number of tools that uh, they are perfectly available and uh, they are partners here. I think that most of them, they are, they are over there on the other side of the wall. So, yeah, this, these are really very good tools that we can use to check the code before it goes into production. But now there's also another point on Lambda layers that I will talk in a minute that we can use that, uh, that is going to, let's say, take out a little bit of the complexity of managing this for every function and every code. For the third part, the storing secrets, of course, we have three services uh, that provide feature that, let's say, uh, it, it, it helps you to not to have to put uh, credentials into code. You shouldn't be doing that in, nevertheless, but still, if you need credentials uh, or secrets into your code, this is the way that you do it. Uh, we have Secrets Manager, of course. We have System Manager Parameter Store, and we have Lambda Encrypted Environment Variables. Uh, in, with these three mechanisms, they basically provide the same type of function, but it's different ways of architecting it. Uh, we can definitely uh, build code that contacts one of these three services, or if you are using Lambda, well, one of these two services, actually, System Manager, Parameter Store, or Secret Manager. And if you are using Lambda functions, you can already use environment variables that are encrypted into the uh, setting of your Lambda function. So, yeah, these are the three, the three points that I wanted to talk about. About the Lambda layers. A Lambda layers is actually a mechanism that provides a way to reuse code across different applications. Um, we can create a number of Lambda layers uh, that are actually reused by other Lambda functions. It provides a separation of responsibilities because we can actually um, have a central team that validates a number of libraries or functions or sub-functions, and that once that they are validated, they are coded into Lambda layers, and those Lambda layers, they are consumed by other Lambda functions. So this is a mechanism that actually helps to validate. Uh, the good thing is that, of course, when you use Lambda layers, you only have to validate your dependencies once. Once that is validated and put at disposition all the Lambda layers for consumption, well, then it's done. You don't have to check that code anymore. Um, whether the, even if you use an approved library and approved, an approved piece of code and you code it, hard coded it into your code, of course, that has to be validated again. So Lambda layers is a way, let's say, of economizing, being a little bit, uh, to, say, to optimize the number, the time, <laughs> and the resources that you put into validating your own code. Now, but what happens about insecure code? What happens if the code that you are, that you are, um, I mean, you are using all of these methods, and nevertheless, you happen, you happen to find out that, that your core logic is actually corrupted, has been compromised, and that you have something in your code that is doing the wrong thing. So it's, it's important to understand how, for example, uh, the runtime of Lambda, lay, uh, Lambda works, so you can decide what you have to look for uh, in uh, typical, uh, let's say, attacks that we see on Lambda code. Now, the Lambda execution environments, um, they are basically, um, they, are, they, they are dedicated per Lambda function. Um, what happens is that there is a control plane and a data plane into the Lambda functions. The control plane is uh, what is going to provide the APIs for function management, create, destroy, activate a function, whatever it is, uh, update the function code, and so on. And uh, the data plane is going to manage the invoke uh, function. Now, whenever you use the invoke, what we are going to do is actually to build a runtime environment. The runtime environment is where you are going to, mm, to run your Lambda code. That runtime environment is particular to the function that you are executing at that time. Um, 
but that runtime environment is built upon something. They are built upon micro VMs that are uh, created into EC2 instances. So what we are seeing uh, from the outside, it's like, yeah, I put code in it and that code is executed. What, happened in, what is happening in the background is that that code, it's being pushed into an EC2 instance, build, um, an execution environment is run, and then we get a result. Now, um, there, right, right now, uh, there are two um, models that are coexisting when it comes to runtime environments. We have the traditional model of DC2 instances, where actually we dedicate one micro VM to build several execution environments in one single EC2 instance. So our micro VMs, um, they are going to be built per account and uh, we are going to build any number of runtime environments that we require on top of that EC2 instance. And uh, yeah, the, the execution environment, yeah, they are going to be uh, isolated among themselves. But since the whole micro VM belongs to a single account, it's a dedicated EC2 instance per account, then you might have several Lambda functions that actually same, share the same hardware, but not the same execution environment. The execution environment is always uh, isolated per function. On the new uh, uh, Firecracker model, which is our uh, uh, specially designed uh, hypervisor for serverless management, uh, that separation in EC2 instance it doesn't exist anymore. And right now, uh, the uh, when you <coughs> sorry about that um, when Firecracker is used, uh, what we see, what you are having actually is that. Um, is that the hardware behind is actually uh, shared between uh, different accounts. So right now there is a whole stack starting on the hypervisor that belongs to a one single function. There is no longer sharing of execution environment. On the other hand, the hardware is shared among, across different, uh, different, uh, uh, across different uh, accounts. Uh, now, um, some design consideration about how the execution runtimes are, are, uh, are working. Well, the first invocation of a Lambda actually, we need to have time to build the runtime environment. The first execution of a Lambda, it always takes more time than the subsequent execution. So it's going to add some latency. That's something to know. But once that they are built, the execution environment, they, are, they can be reused. Now, because the execution environment, they are going to be reused, there are two aspects to take into account. One is the memory. Memory, it's still dedicated. Subsequent um, execution of the same Lambda function, they are going to share the same memory space. If your application logic requires to have a clean memory space, that's something that has to be added into your application code, either at the start of the function or at the end of the function once it is executed, as you prefer. But if not, then you are sharing the same uh, memory space. Now, it's a memory space that still is dedicated for the execution environment of the Lambda functions, which limits a little bit the, the let's say, the potential damage. But it's important for you to know if you are going to do, a, let's say, multi-tenancy of different customers using the same Lambda functions. The data that is going to be handled by the Lambda function, it might, it might be uh, providing for different sources that you want to keep them isolated. Well, they are going to be using the same memory space, take care of the account. The second is that the execution environment, they also, it also includes a TMP, a, a temporary writable system. Again, this is something that is there. It's, it's part of the design. If you don't want to use it, or there is something in the Lambda function that requires the downloading of data and the use of that temporary file system, and you don't want to share it, that, that data, with the ex subsequent execution of Lambda function, again, something to be taken into account into the application code. Now, um, Lambda provides by default a number of runtimes uh, that are there, but you are not limited by that. You have the opportunity to actually put any type of runtime that you want. But if you do that, then we are no longer taking care of the patching. So if you, for some reason, you are using custom runtimes because you need to build your application logic in a language that is not supported by Lambda, you need to be taking care, I mean, you need to be taking care of the patching of that, um, of that system. So knowing that there is an execution environment and there is going to be a reuse, as a best practice, you need to be planned for it. Just minimize the package size to the necessities because the less, uh, let's say, the, the, the smaller that your code is, 
the less space that we will need into the execution environment, the more times the execution environment can be reused for the same function. Um, if you, for some reason, you are going to need a VPC support, that requires an any, and that any is going to be attached during the call start. So, um, again, that adds a lot of latency when it comes to the, to the uh, first execution. Uh, so take care also uh, into that if you have specific latency requirements for uh, your application. And uh, as a good practice, because um, if you need to have the clients or database clients, plan for the reuse of those connections. Those connections, they are executed during the runtime, uh, the execution uh, setup, the execution environment setup. So uh, if you have to do that, instead of putting that into your call logic, into your Lambda handler, into the, your uh, auxiliary functions into, into the code, put it as part of the initial runtime of the, of the code. Uh, and uh, again, um, don't write into TMP if you don't need it. That's, uh, that's going to something that probably is going to lead you only, only to travel. Now, when it comes to ECS and Fargate, and I'm going to be very short on this because there is a lot of sessions about uh, ECS and Fargate. Um, as I said, the main difference is that we are going to have uh, EC2 instances running ECS for when it comes to ECS and EKS. And uh, we are, so we are going to have auto scaling groups to into into that logic. Those are the scaling groups. Um, well, it's something that you need to manage the capacity in advance to be sure that you are going to have what you need. Um, but uh, basically, that's an, a necessity that you will not have to do if you use Fargate. <clears throat> Fargate, it's something, it's, I mean, it's going to manage the auto scaling of the infrastructure as long as they need. Uh, and it's only based on three parameters, which is task and services, exactly the same thing as ECS and EKS. It's completely normal, it's container management. But instead of having to manage a cluster, the only thing that you need to pre, uh, let's say, to calculate, it's the amount of CPU and the amount of memory that your task is going to, are going to require. Now, um, when it comes to ECS and ECF, there are a number of points that needs to be taken um, also as a potential pain points for your services. In, in ECS, because we are running uh, in an EC2 instances, by default, it's the EC2 instance any, the interface that is going to be taken. If we don't specify otherwise, there's a possibility to actually define one specific interface per task. But that's not the default setting. The default setting is use the interface of the EC2 instance that they're using to run your task. So if you need to separate your task and your traffic task and identify the network traffic in your VPCs per task, please be sure that these options are activated. This is not a problem that exists in Fargate because uh, the IP addresses, uh, uh, that, I mean, the, the, uh, there is always going to be a task any by default when you define a task. We don't have EC2 instances to manage. It's managed by, by Fargate. Now, uh, on the other hand, ECS, you can reuse your existing security groups and knuckles that you are already uh, deployed into your, uh, into your VPCs. But when it comes to uh, Fargate, uh, there is already a default setting, which is um, the outbound traffic is allowed. And uh, that's, if that's not exactly what you want, it's something to be taken into consideration before selecting the service, even if it's easier to manage. <clears throat> if you are going to manage that, then we need to add another layer, let's say, of traffic management on top of Fargate so we can manage the outbound traffic. When it comes to IAM, they both ex work exactly the same. We can, we can put granular um, roles and policies per tasks. Um, and when it comes to the host management, as, uh, as, as I said before, um, AWS take care of everything related to the host management when it's Fargate. If it's uh, ECS or EKS, then you have to do that part by yourself, at least for the worker nodes in AKS. But there is an additional consideration. Um, because you are managing the hosts, that means that privileged access is allowed. So take care of the accesses to the hosts that run in your ECS or AKS cluster, because that access exists. Um, in Fargate, it doesn't exist. That's our part of responsibility. 
we take care of those access do not exist, so the tasks uh, cannot have access to the, to the uh, underlying access. Now, I'm going to go very quickly for the data layer because this is something that I'm sure that we have seen a lot of uh, times before. Um, there are several aspects to take into account here. First of all is the data classification. How do we know that we are dealing with the right type of data or what data are we, are we treating with our serverless services? For that, we typically use MASI uh, in, if your data is in S3. Uh, if your data is in RDS, and right now we don't have a service that is scanned data into RDS, well, we'll see. Uh, but uh, for the, if you're, you, are scan, you are using your data into, uh, into, I mean, you're storing your data into S3, Massey is going to give you a lot of, of uh, ways to actually identify what data you, have, you are working with. Uh, for the data flow, uh, X-Ray, X-Ray, we're going to see it in a minute. Um, this is the main mechanism for both serverless and containers to have a view of what's happening and what is the data flow on our services. Uh, data tokenization is a, is a big, uh, is a big uh, subject, uh, big subject of discussion uh, around because in a lot of cases we don't need to deal with the original piece of data. We can deal with all the data transformed and our, our applications are going to work mostly the same. So in this case, we don't still don't have any service for data tokenization, uh, as far as I know. Well, there are lots of announcements today, so you never know. Uh, but so that's something that you will have to do it by yourself it, to deal and to treat your data, to have it ready to com be consumed by an application. And there are also a lot of solutions in, in the marketplace that can help uh, help with that. Uh, when it comes to encryption, of course, uh, when it comes to encryption and REST, a KMS it's the mostly mm, most successful mechanism because of the native integration with AWS services. So wherever you uh, you put any kind of data in AWS, KMS is kind of the obvious way to go. Um, when it comes to encryption and transit, there are two points where we should be taking care of. First of all, is where we are going to expose our services to the external world, which is our IP gateway. We need to be sure that IP gateway is only using HTTPS. And for managing the, the certificates that we need to establish those HTTPS services, then we can use Certificate Manager, which is actually integrated with, uh, with the AP Gateway. Um, for the data replication and backup, of course, well, this is going to be um, depending a lot of the service that you are going to use for the three most typical one, S3, DynamoDB, and RDS. Um, there are different mechanisms. We always recommend S3 activate versioning, MFA delete, so you can, nobody's going to delete any kind of data unless they have a MFA authentication. And uh, if your data is specifically, uh, special, especially um, critical, then allow for a cross-bucket replication, a cross-region replication of your data. Uh, for DynamoDB, we have, uh, we have uh, always on-demand backup. There is always point-in-time point restore um, possibilities. So, being a serverless database, well, it's something that we have already taken care of, uh, that you don't have to manage for the backups, just, you just have to tell us when do you want those backups done. And uh, for Amazon, the FDS is exactly the same, the same thing. Um, when it comes to the uh, management and identity layer, well, there is a number of points to take, uh, take into account. We need to authenticate and authorize always the end users. Um, API Gateway, and uh, Cognito, if you are using mobile applications, these are two services that we always uh, recommend a lot to consider when it comes to the authentication of, of, uh, <coughs> of users of uh, API, of uh, serverless services. Um, unless these are internal services when we can go for IAM services. And in particular for the IAM services, it's a, it's a, let's say, I would say that IAM is the single most critical important uh, services that we have in AWS uh, because we control everything with IAM. So the moment that you have internal customers, internal clients, I mean, within your services uh, in AWS, whether they are from your own company, for other company, but also using AWS, we can control all the identity and access management using IAM. <clears throat> when it comes to the system monitoring layer, um, well, there are a lot of uh, mechanisms that are always um, there, uh, what we require from this layer is actually to provide visibility. We need logs, we need traces, we need metrics. 
and uh, in a lot of cases we those metrics they are not re they are not related to how my service is performing but how my service is configured is it good or not so for the login trace and the metrics part, uh, of course, we need to have access log and execution logs from the API gateway. Uh, that's a native feature, so you have to have point to one click and you will have them. For Lambda, uh, you also have CloudWatch logs. Again, uh, CloudWatch logs is integrated with Lambda function. The moment that you execute a Lambda function and it has the right permissions to put data into CloudWatch logs, then we come back to IAM, that, that data is going to appear immediately. And we have X-Ray, I'll see you in a minute. Um, so when it comes to uh, metrics, uh, again, built-in uh, CloudWatch metrics, the integration of the services with CloudWatch is native. There are built-in CloudWatch metrics, there are uh, detailed CloudWatch metrics in both API and Lambda functions. The built-in, they are activated by default. The moment that you start using the service, you will have this visibility. You want to have more detailed metrics, uh, in, in terms of time and in terms of content, then we need to activate the, the required functions. And of course, there are also, again, a number of third-party tools for monitoring that provide an extra visibility on top of what AWS has already built. Um, for compliance validation, this is a, a kind of more easy part because um, everything, uh, the state of every resource that is configured in AWS is uh, stored in config. And the config allows the building of config rules. Config rules is just a piece of code that is going to check into our database configuration, into, into, the, sorry, into the CMDB, um, to check the configuration of your state. If that, uh, of your resource, if that resource deviates from the, uh, from the desired state, then it's going to be an alarm. Um, we, we recognize a lot that the building of config rules or the use of the existing config rules to when you have specific compliance uh, uh, requirements, whether they are for internal standards or external or external requirements, whether it's for, for uh, standard regulations and so on. And uh, yeah, we last time that I checked, we provisioned something like uh, 69, if I recall, different config rules uh, in, available for you to use. If those config rules they fit your purpose, perfect, they are there for you to use. Uh, but if they aren't, there is always the possibility. I mean, the code is available. The code is stored in GitHub, and uh, so you can take that code and build upon it to adapt it to your particular use case, or build your own config rules starting from scratch. So there is there is always the possibility that you put your own business logic into the config rules. Now on X-Ray, uh, X-Ray uh, is our, uh, let's say, monitoring system, which is specifically designed for serverless and containers. Uh, we can have a, a good view of what is going on with the uh, data flows and the treatment of the code into uh, both serverless and containers. We have an end-to-end -end view, whether it's in AWS, and uh, we can actually see um, where the choke points of our applications are located. Uh, when it comes to serverless, and, we, and by here I mean Lambda, the activation is extremely easy, it's just one click. Now, if your application, uh, if you want to have a better view of your application, there are pieces of code that you can include into your application, so your own application is pushing data into X-Ray for a better visibility. So, uh, the only thing that you need to do for, uh, for Lambda Functions is activate the, acti the tracing, uh, and if I can recall correctly, in a CloudFormation template, something like tracing config enabled. That's it, that's all, and then you will start having a, a view that we're going to see. Um, in the integration with containers is a little bit different because we need we provide a container specifically for X-Ray. So you need to deploy an X-Ray Docker container or pod in Kubernetes into every worker node. So that that data from your containers and from your, um, your data application is forwarded into the container and from there onwards forwarded into the uh, into the X-Ray um, central uh, dashboard. Now, um, there is also two, uh, two plugins that we provide, which are easy to plug in and ECS plugin, um, that actually you can use to provide information over the underlying infrastructure that your container is running on. Uh, when you are using ECS or EKS, of course, well, you have privileged access to what the, the infrastructure is, I mean, the, to the uh, server that your, your content is running on. 
and uh, with these plugins, we can pull out data from the infrastructure and export that into X-Ray. This is helpful if we actually locate um, some things that actually are not running properly into our application because we are uh, have an infrastructure problem. Now, that view is not available on Fargate because with Fargate, you don't have an access to the underlying infrastructure. We take care of, if there's any problem with the physical infrastructure, we will take care of that. But if you are using ECS or EKS, uh, it's actually uh, helpful to use these two types of plugin. Now, with X-Ray, what we have, we have this type of view. We can locate every element of our infrastructure, of our, uh, our container services, and we can identify what container is communicating with who. I mean, so the, all the interactions within the different elements of our task and our services, and the timers. Uh, so this is always helpful to identify there are actually some processing in some containers that takes more time than others. Uh, and this is the kind of view that you have with traces. I mean, we consolidate all of the data that we, reside, that we are receiving from your containers and we consolidate it into a view that is very similar to a, a developer view in a browser. Uh, but we can also have information if the EC2 or ECS plugins are activated about the underlying hosts. Now, um, this is probably the most, uh, the most uh, let's say, uh, the part where, where uh, security professionals that have done security all the like get a little bit more lost because uh, this is a view that is absolutely very familiar for developers. Development teams, they have been using CI-CD pipelines for a long time. Uh, and uh, for a security perspective, uh, this is, uh, we are not that familiar with it. So the purpose, uh, the, how a pipeline works is kind of sometimes magical, but in basically, uh, you know that we have built all of, these, all of these tools to actually transform the development practice and make them easier. So we can start just from a source code and pass through every step of the way, including building, test, and validation of services before uh, we go into production. And once it's in pro into production, then we have a good view of what's going on. Now, um, how do we ensure that we can uh, embed uh, security into the whole story? Well, the, the answer, although it can be obvious, is not that easy to implement, which is actually to, implement, to include the security function into the CI-CD uh, development pipelines. How do we do that? It's by allowing them to define controls into the CI-CD pipeline. In general, what happens, or what we observe, is that CI-CD pipelines, they are owned by development teams. And uh, in a lot of cases, uh, security is not part of the whole story. They are, they are part of the, the final product. Once that you have uh, put your uh, code through a CI-CD pipeline, then security will look at the end of it what's going on. Well, that's okay, but that's already uh, what I mentioned at the beginning when it came to detective uh, and responsive control. That for us is a detective and a responsive control. One that you have done the work, then I'm going to look at it and see what's going on. And what we aim for is to put that control a little bit earlier into the whole story. So we aim to actually uh, include security controls into the development pipelines. Now, a few words about, about the code pipeline, and uh, I'm going to be finishing very soon. Um, in code pipeline, actually, yes, you commit your code to a source repository and you define every step that you want to have uh, until a final deployment using CloudFormation in AWS. Um, what, I'm, what, what is in a lot of cases uh, not very, very uh, used is that actually a lot of these controls, they can be Lambda functions in itself. That means that we can perfectly define the shape and the, and the content of the controls that we want to implement into our code pipelines. We don't need to put scanners that actually decide by ourselves what we are going to look for. No, we have the opportunity to decide by ourselves what, we, what am I looking for. And uh, in the case of AWS, when everything is infrastructure as code, we can definitely code what we have seen just in the, all the previous slides, all of these options that need to be activated in a certain way, well, we can definitely look at, is, the, is encryption enabled? It's uh, X-ray uh, configured? It's, um, I don't know, it's uh, HTTPS activated from, uh, from AP gateways. So every preventive security measure 
that we want to implement into our serverless services, they can be introduced and coded as a Lambda function that checks for it into a development pipeline. Now, even if we do all of the kind of check, you need to plot for the worst case. The worst case scenario is that you have to do rollback on your deployments. Well, code deploy has also this kind of possibilities that uh, you, do, you don't do one shot changes, you do gradual changes over a production environment so you can monitor little by little if the production is going well. And in case that you need to do, to do a rollback, code deploy is going to manage the rollback for you so you can come back to the previous situation. But this, this is something that has to be planned for. When it comes to the security in using deployment layers and deployment tools, what are the things that we have to look for? Um, first of all, our code is going to come from somewhere. If we are using uh, service, serverless services, we are going to use code commit. If we are, going, if we are using uh, ECR, then we, I mean, if we are using containers, we are going to use ECRs. And uh, being AWS services, of course, uh, they are all managed by IAM policies. So we can definitely uh, control the access to these services and decide what pipeline has access to certain type of, uh, of code or repositories. With the code quality, um, well, as I said, we can put security controls into our, into our code pipeline. There are some third-party tools that uh, are already available in the shape of Lambda functions uh, provided by our, uh, our, cost, uh, our partners that you can immediately start using. And uh, we have also, as I said at the beginning, Lambda layers when you can pre-prepare uh, the authorized uh, libraries that you, want to be, uh, that you want to use and be sure that these are the right libraries. And uh, plan for your strategy for deployments. There are lots of things that we can use, like a code deploy for blue-green or canary deployments. CloudWatch, always activate CloudWatch to see what is going on during your deployments and use tools like X-Ray so you can look at if your deployment after it has been deployed is performing the way that it's expected. Now, very quickly, um, and I only have three minutes, so it's going to be short. Um, this is a pipeline pattern. It's not published yet, but it's going to be published uh, quite soon. It's a pipeline pattern that we have designed with uh, some of our customers uh, to actually uh, decide what do we have, I mean, how we are going to look at, at all of this. What we are having is the, the target is that a developer, a developer function has only to provide two pieces of data, the code of the application and a cloud formation template to use ECS and Lambda or, or other things. But we are going to have the security function to decide everything that is going to happen as a, uh, as a control into the code analysis. That doesn't give them ownership of the whole pipeline, it gives them only ownership of the content of those controls. And uh, this is basically the pattern architecture that we provide. What we are going to, what, what we are building and we have built and it will be published, it's a, a master pipeline that actually is going to control the content of the secondary application pipelines. Every piece of data that is provided by developers in terms of cloud formation template and code, they are going to go through a normal standard pipeline. But the content of the controls in the code analysis, they are going to come from another pipeline whose content, it actually is pro it's provided either by the developers sometimes for the, when it comes to the service testing or the uh, security of the security functions in there. Uh, this is something that I wanted actually to show you, to show it working, but uh, I'm not sure, that, yeah, I'm not going to have time for in two minutes, I'm sorry about that. But in any case, um, this is something that is going to be published, uh, it's going, it will be public in GitHub, in our repositories, so you can actually experiment by yourself uh, whether this is something that actually fits fits, uh, it's going to fit your need. Um, just a little bit of details, is we are not going to see it. What we aim with this type of, of infrastructure is precisely to deal with these two pieces of code which are the most important when it comes to a development pipeline and uh, have three types, four types in control in reality. First of all, we are going to validate the source code to ensure that there are no wrong things into the original standard code. In a lot of cases, we don't know exactly what we are looking for, but we can also use another type of corrective mechanisms, like, for example, uh, PureSec Function Shield. PureSec Function Shield is a security library that uh, um, helps you to, for example, to block outbound connectivity outside of AWS of Lambda functions. So. These are, these are mechanisms that they're constantly evolving. There are a lot of there, um, the, but 
if we can use it properly and we can implement them and embed them directly into our, into our code pipelines, actually, even if we don't know what we are looking for, we provide a first layer of this is not going to happen. The function silly if I recall correctly, they provide um, security configurations to block advanced connectivity, to avoid writing on TMP functions, to uh, avoid uh, functions that actually read into the uh, into the handlers of uh, of uh, code functions, and uh, yeah, create child processes. So these are things that actually indicate a suspect activity. We provide the two layers of validation of the CFN, of the cloud formation template. So we expect resources to be configured in a certain way, and we ensure that it's done that way. And finally, we have the test deployment. So yeah, that's, that is all of it. I hope that it was useful. I expect that it was useful. And uh, if you have more questions, here we are. Please don't forget to complete the session if you really like it. I, and I really apologize for not having time to complete the demo. So that it will be published and uh, you will have it. Thank you.